tell God all of my troubles when I get home. Hello, and welcome to the History of Africana Philosophy by T.K. Jeffers and Peter Adamson, brought to you with the support of the King's College London Philosophy Department and the LMU in Munich, online at historyofphilosophy.net. Today's episode, Kill or Be Killed, David Walker's Appeal. When you're writing and you want to indicate emphasis, you can use underlining or boldface characters, but to really lay it on thick, there's nothing like an exclamation point. Depending on how strongly you feel, you might even decide that one exclamation point is not enough. Judging from social media, three of them would seem to be a popular choice. For David Walker, though, three exclamation points counted as an understatement. This pioneering figure in the African-American philosophical tradition regularly used up to eight of them in his classic work, first published in 1829, under one of those lengthy titles to which we're becoming accustomed, Walker's Appeal in Four Articles, together with a preamble to the colored citizens of the world, but in particular and very expressly to those of the United States of America. A radical and uncompromising indictment of American racial oppression, Walker's Appeal is full of exclamation points expressing rage, frustration, and disbelief at how African Americans are treated. Consider this statement of purpose from the preamble. I appeal to heaven for my motive in writing. Who knows that my object is, if possible, to awaken in the breasts of my afflicted, degraded, and slumbering brethren a spirit of inquiry and investigation respecting our miseries and wretchedness in this republican land of liberty. That last phrase here is italicized, capitalized, and followed by no fewer than six exclamation points. Points don't get much more exclamatory than that. Walker uses typography to stress that the idea of the United States as a land of freedom and civic equality is a mockery, a sham, in light of the experiences of African Americans. As one scholar who has studied the typography of the appeal has pointed out, Walker did not live in an age when writing such a string of exclamation points would be a simple matter of holding down two keys and counting to three. Whether through a manuscript or perhaps even in person, Walker had to direct the printer to set the precise number of exclamation points through the manual arrangement of individual pieces of type. Just imagine what he could have done with a computer keyboard, or for that matter, with emojis. But let's come to the point. Who was this passionate writer and thinker, and how was his radical denunciation of American racism received? What we know of Walker's place of birth and parentage comes from a biographical sketch written by Henry Highland Garnett, who was influenced by Walker and who will be the subject of his own episode in this series. Walker was born in the port city of Wilmington, North Carolina, probably in 1796 or 97, the son of an enslaved father and a free mother. As one inherited the status of one's mother, this meant Walker was born free. Wilmington at this time was majority black, with all but a tiny few of this majority enslaved. While still a young man, Walker left Wilmington for Charleston, South Carolina, where there was a much larger free black population. While we don't know for sure when he lived in Charleston, it's quite possible that he was there for the momentous events of 1822, when the apparent discovery and foiling of a plot for a massive rebellion against slavery, allegedly organized by a man named Denmark Vesey, led to the execution of Vesey and 34 others. Recent historical scholarship on the Vesey plot is divided. Many believe that Vesey was not so much a conspiratorial leader as the victim of a conspiracy by the white authorities who executed him, supported by testimony from witnesses who were tortured and threatened with death. So we should not necessarily assume that the surviving testimony of these witnesses gives us access to Vesey's thought. Still, there are striking similarities between the ideas those witnesses attributed to Vesey and what we find in Walker's appeal. This point has been made by Peter Hinks, author of the most thorough study of Walker's life and times. He notes parallels between Vesey and Walker on such matters as the religious foundation for resistance, the need for black ambition and self-exertion, the necessity of violence, the treachery of informants, the importance of unity, and the role of Haiti as a paradigm of solidarity. Perhaps then the Charleston of 1822 was the very time and place in which Walker's political philosophy first took shape. Within the next couple of years, Walker left Charleston, apparently going to various points further south and further west. 
This period of travel is not of merely biographical significance, for his observations of the slaveholding South and other parts of the country serve as the empirical foundation of Walker's analysis of the African-American condition in his appeal. He probably made his way to Philadelphia because he was a great admirer of Richard Allen and writes of him in terms that suggest personal experience of this remarkable leader of the African Methodist Episcopal Church. By some time late in 1824, Walker arrived in Boston and established a business there, a second-hand clothing store. From here to his death in 1830, we have much better documentation for his life story. These five years saw Walker establish himself as a business owner, a leading activist, a public speaker, and most importantly, for our purposes, an author. He also married and started a family before his untimely death. While in Boston, he became a Mason, as mentioned in episode 40. He was initiated in the summer of 1826 into the same African lodge founded by Prince Hall some four decades prior. The following year, the Boston Lodge declared its independence from the English and established itself as the Grand Lodge for all Prince Hall Freemasons, as they now called themselves. Walker's membership connected him with other significant members of Boston's Black community. In another link to topics we've already discussed, Walker was one of the most enthusiastic supporters and promoters of Freedom's Journal, the Black newspaper edited by Samuel Cornish and John Russworm. Even before the newspaper's first issue was published, in March of 1827, Walker held a gathering at his home to drum up interest and support. He was the New York-based newspaper's subscription agent in Boston, and multiple speeches of his were reported or recorded in Freedom's Journal. Most prominent among these was a December 1828 speech, which brings us to his involvement in the founding of the Massachusetts General Colored Association, a pioneering civil rights organization. It lasted as a distinct organization only from 1828 to 1833, when it became an auxiliary of William Lloyd Garrison's New England Anti-Slavery Society. But at its founding, Walker believed it could play a major role in bringing about change, not just in Massachusetts, but nationwide. Speaking at the first of its semi-annual meetings, he announced that, The primary object of this institution is to unite the colored population so far through the United States of America as may be practicable and expedient. He complained that disunity was a major factor in the failure of African Americans to achieve progress. Once they were unified, he proposed that the community should go on to explore all possible avenues toward change. As he put it, it is indispensably our duty to try every scheme that we think will have a tendency to facilitate our salvation and leave the final result to that God who holds the destinies of people in the hollow of his hand and whoever has and will repay every nation according to its works. How many listening to Walker on that day knew how serious and how radical he was in saying that every scheme must be tried? He left implicit in this speech what would become explosively explicit in his appeal, his belief that African Americans must be prepared to engage in violence whenever necessary in order to secure their liberation. His book, first published in September of 1829, was revolutionary in this non-metaphorical sense. In fact, 1829 was a year that saw several important publications in Africana literature and political thought. In Walker's home state of North Carolina, there lived an enslaved man named George Moses Horton, who, like Jupiter Hammond and Phyllis Wheatley before him, gained recognition for his poetry. In 1829, he was able to publish a collection of his poems called the Hope of Liberty. The book's title was earnest and literal because Horton hoped to raise money enough through its publication to purchase his freedom. Walker knew of Horton and joined with other subscribers to Freedom's Journal in raising money to secure his liberty, but to no avail. Horton continued to write and publish poetry, but remained enslaved until the Civil War and the emancipation of all slaves. More similar to Walker's appeal, but also frustratingly mysterious, is a pamphlet published in February of 1829 called The Ethiopian Manifesto Issued in Defense of the Black Man's Rights in the Scale of Universal Freedom. The author identified himself as Red Naxella, which is Alexander backwards. We know because of his registration of the document that his name was Robert Alexander Young. Decrying the lack of rights for black people around the globe and issuing a prophetic call for change, it is thematically comparable to Walker's appeal 
but we have no evidence concerning whether Walker read it. Most philosophically interesting in the manifesto is its introspective description of an inner voice of intuitive justice that demands recognition of human equality. Most bizarre, on the other hand, is its messianic revelation that a liberator who will bring an end to slavery has already been born, a savior in relation to whom Young considers himself a sort of John the Baptist. This man, according to Young, is white in appearance but born of a black mother on the island of Grenada, and has webbed toes on both of his feet. That Young is speaking of a particular person seems likely from the details given, but it is unknown who he was and why Young believed him to be so special. There's actually a messianic moment in Walker's appeal, too, where he writes, Beloved brethren, here let me tell you, and believe it, that the Lord our God, as true as he sits on his throne in heaven, and as true our Savior died to redeem the world, will give you a Hannibal. The person whom God shall give you, give him your support, and let him go his length, and behold in him the salvation of your God. Unlike Young, though, Walker spends little time encouraging this kind of faith in a coming liberator, and much more time preaching the necessity of unity, self-reliance, and bravery on the part of all Black people, including bravery to commit violence where appropriate. Like Thomas Paine's Common Sense before it, and Marx and Engels' Communist Manifesto after it, this is a philosophical work, but also an impassioned plea for collective action. In a note placed before the preamble in the third and final edition, Walker writes, It is expected that all colored men, women, and children of every nation, language, and tongue under heaven will try to procure a copy of this appeal and read it, or get someone to read it to them for it is designed more particularly for them. For Walker, this was no idle wish. He did his best to put his call to action into the hands of those who needed to hear it. Within a few months of the publication of the first edition, the police department of Savannah, Georgia, seized 60 copies of it that had been delivered to a local black preacher. Once alerted to its contents, the state of Georgia banned the book and made new laws quarantining all black sailors entering Georgia ports. The mayor of Savannah wrote to the mayor of Boston, demanding that Walker be arrested, but received the unwelcome reply that, despite the bad and inflammatory tendency of the work, no Massachusetts law had been broken. We also know of copies sent to Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Louisiana, because in all these places, arrests were made and further legal action was taken to contain it. The laws passed were harsh. For example, the law against literature that might incite black unrest in Louisiana made distribution of Walker's book punishable by death. It is unknown how many incidents of slave rebellion, planned or executed, can be connected to the circulation of the appeal, but some at that time certainly believed Walker to have been the inspiration for an attempt in North Carolina in 1830. Sixty slaves gathered in a swamp and armed themselves, but a local militia got to them and all were killed. The most famous slave revolt in U.S. history happened in 1831 in Virginia, led by a Baptist preacher named Nat Turner. It has been irresistible for scholars to speculate on the possible influence of Walker on Turner's uprising, but there is no hard evidence allowing us to draw that connection. But let's turn away from the hysteria surrounding the book's publication to what the book itself has to say. Perhaps the best way to understand its structure and organizing theme is to put aside its most controversial element, its advocacy of violent resistance, and focus instead on Walker's engagement with Thomas Jefferson, whom he praises in extravagant terms, a much greater philosopher the world never afforded. There is characteristic bombast here, no doubt, but not sarcasm. His criticism of Jefferson is, in fact, all the more poignant, given his recognition of Jefferson as brilliant, a vast repository of knowledge, and a political thinker capable of writing such a document as the Declaration of Independence. Yet this same man was responsible for the repugnant remarks on the natural inferiority of black people in query 14 of his Notes on the State of Virginia, remarks that we discussed in some detail in episode 35. As a symbol of the mind-warping power of American racism, it is telling that the otherwise brilliant Jefferson's thoughts on black people are so ridiculous. Walker writes, Has Mr. Jefferson declared to the world that we are inferior to the whites? both in the endowments of our bodies and of minds? It is indeed surprising that a man of such great learning, combined with such excellent natural parts, should speak so of a set of men in chains. 
I know not what to compare it to, unless, like putting one wild deer in an iron cage where it will be secured, and hold another by the side of the same, then let it go, and expect the one in the cage to run as fast as the one at liberty. The obvious inadequacy of Jefferson's analysis illustrates how white Americans resort to the flimsiest of reasonings to justify the domination of black Americans. In one memorable passage, though, Walker states that his aim is to solicit each of my brethren who has the spirit of a man to buy a copy of Mr. Jefferson's Notes on Virginia and put it in the hand of his son. Why? He explains that some white writers have opposed Jefferson's comments about black people, but this is insufficient. For let no one of us suppose that the refutations which have been written by our white friends are enough. They are whites, we are blacks. We and the world wish to see the charges of Mr. Jefferson refuted by the blacks themselves according to their chance. For we must remember that what the whites have written respecting this subject is other men's labors and did not emanate from the blacks. Later, he puts the point even more forcefully, unless we try to refute Mr. Jefferson's arguments respecting us, we will only establish them. Walker here exploits Jefferson's racism as a challenge to African Americans, a means of goading them towards accomplishments that will distinguish them so as to prove the hollowness of Jefferson's claims about natural inferiority. But why is this necessary if the flimsiness of Jefferson's argument is so obvious? Why take time disproving claims that are ridiculous on their face? Is Walker trying to have it both ways? One way to resolve the contradiction is to see Walker as encouraging simultaneous awareness of two different perspectives. On the one hand, there is an impartial perspective, from which it is obvious that Black people are not inferior in the way that Jefferson suggests. This perspective is useful to buttress a sense of self-worth among Blacks. On the other hand, one should not underestimate how widespread and entrenched are derogatory perspectives on Black people, to the extent that even the brilliant Jefferson took their natural inferiority as a completely reasonable possibility worth investigating, rather than seeing it for the preposterous bigotry it is. The culminating point of Jefferson's discussion of Black inferiority is his claim that the study of slavery in ancient times helps prove that it is not the social condition of slavery, but something more inherent that makes Black people inferior. We know, he says, that among the Romans, about the Augustan age especially, the condition of their slaves was much more deplorable than that of the Blacks on the continent of America. After compiling evidence for this claim, Jefferson draws a conclusion. Notwithstanding these and other discouraging circumstances among the Romans, their slaves were often their rarest artists. They excelled too in science, in so much as to be usually employed as tutors to their master's children. Epictetus, Terence, and Phaedrus were slaves, but they were of the race of whites. It is not their condition then, but nature, which has produced the distinction. Once one has noticed the various functions Jefferson serves in Walker's argument, it becomes more obvious that the book is structured around this very point. He needs to prove that it is indeed the vicious treatment of slaves in America that explains their condition. The preamble begins with a sort of thesis statement for the book as a whole. Having traveled over a considerable portion of these United States, and having in the course of my travels taken the most accurate observations of things as they exist, the result of my observations has warranted the full and unshaken conviction that we, colored people of these United States, are the most degraded, wretched, an abject set of beings that ever lived since the world began. And I pray God that none like us may ever live again until time shall be no more. After the preamble, the appeal is divided into four sections or chapters that Walker refers to, in imitation of the Constitution, as articles. Each article reinforces the thesis by exploring a different dimension of the wretchedness characterizing the situation of African Americans. Article 1 is entitled our wretchedness in consequence of slavery. It is here that Walker responds most directly to Jefferson's comparative argument, making his own comparisons between African Americans and ancient peoples who were enslaved, such as the Hebrews in Egypt, the Helots of Sparta, and of course the slaves of the Romans. Article 2, Our Wretchedness in Consequence of Ignorance, does deal with ignorance in the sense of a lack of knowledge, as when Walker complains of widespread ignorance of English grammar. More central, though, is a thoroughly moralized notion of ignorance, associating it with servility and a failure to value the humanity of one's fellow black people. Article 3 is 
our wretchedness in consequence of the preachers of the religion of Jesus Christ. And as one might imagine, it discusses white Christian hypocrisy. Finally, in Article 4, our wretchedness in consequence of the colonizing plan, Walker rails against the American Colonization Society and strongly opposes the emigration of African Americans to Liberia. The fact that Article 4 is by far the longest of the four articles is a reminder of what a central concern and matter of controversy this was at the time. Articles 1 and 2, however, are where we find Walker's thoughts on violence. From the first to the third edition of the Appeal, he became more and more outspoken on this topic. In the first edition, we find him saying, Remember that unless you are united, keeping your tongues within your teeth, you will be afraid to trust your secrets to each other and thus perpetuate our miseries under the Christians. And by the way, Christians is italicized, but gets only five exclamation points. The casual reader might find this claim a bit vague. What are these secrets, and what does keeping them have to do with the perpetuation of miseries? In the second edition, he clarifies that he means secret plans for violent resistance. He endorses this form of resistance without reservation, proclaiming it to be divinely sanctioned, although he is also careful to warn that it must only be used when the timing is just right. Remember, he says, also to lay humble at the feet of our Lord and Master Jesus Christ with prayers and fastings. Let our enemies go on with their butcheries, and at once fill up their cup. Never make an attempt to gain our freedom of natural right from under our cruel oppressors and murderers until you see your way clear. When that hour arrives and you move, be not afraid or dismayed, for be you assured that Jesus Christ, the King of heaven and of earth, who is the God of justice and of armies, will surely go before you. Many find the ethics of violence to be the most philosophically challenging aspect of the appeal. Walker defends violence as not merely permissible, but in certain circumstances even obligatory. In a striking portion of Article 2, he conversely criticizes mercy as being strictly impermissible in some cases. He quotes a newspaper report of an incident in Kentucky. Sixty slaves were being transported through the state when some managed to get loose. They attacked the three white men transporting them, killing two and leaving a third for dead, a man named Gordon. An enslaved woman helped Gordon to mount his horse, and he managed to rally the neighborhood, thus enabling the capture of all the escaped slaves and the execution of eight of them. Walker minces no words in expressing his utter disgust at the behavior of the woman who held Gordon, to the excuse that it was her natural fine feelings that motivated her to help him. Walker replies, but I declare, the actions of this black woman are really insupportable. For my own part, I cannot think it was anything but servile deceit combined with the most gross ignorance, for we must remember that humanity, kindness, and the fear of the Lord does not consist in protecting devils. In this case, mercy towards Gordon ultimately led to the most unmerciful of results, an observation that justifies this steely-eyed advice. If you commence, make sure work. Do not trifle, for they will not trifle with you. They want us for their slaves, and think nothing of murdering us in order to subject us to that wretched condition. Therefore, if there is an attempt made by us, kill or be killed. In a particularly harsh and even shocking passage found in the aforementioned addition to Article 1, he asserts the obligatory nature of violent resistance in this way. The man who would not fight under our Lord and Master Jesus Christ in the glorious and heavenly cause of freedom and of God to be delivered from the most wretched, abject, and servile slavery that ever a people was afflicted with since the foundation of the world to the present day ought to be kept with all of his children or family in slavery or in chains to be butchered by his cruel enemies. Can he really mean this, or is it just heavy handed rhetoric intended to motivate resistance? Certainly, one need not be a pacifist to worry that Walker has gone too far. But it would be a mistake to fasten onto these passages as if they contained Walker's entire moral and political thought. In fact, his impassioned writing was capable of inspiring readers who were not attracted by the justification of violence. We can see this by turning to a subsequent thinker who was inspired by Walker, but who chose to downplay the threat of violence almost to the point of eliminating it from the agenda she took over from him. We are speaking of Maria W. Stewart, who became the first American woman to give public lectures, not just black women, but to keep with our punctuation theme, 
the first American woman to give public lectures, full stop. Of course, there will be a short period of waiting until it's ready, but once our installment on Stuart is available, we hope you'll dash to listen to the next episode of The History of African Philosophy. I'm gonna tell God